Hi, everyone. Um, sorry about the delay. Not sure what happened. Um, my name is Philip. Je m'appelle Philippe. Uh, je suis le principal rum distiller uh, Akamai. Um, Aujourd'hui, je présente uh, mon recherche sur le, les bias uh, cognitifs, sur les mesures de performance. Et maintenant, je continue en anglais. <laughs> Okay, so um, bias is an expectation. Right? Uh, the, our journey today will be focusing on these three things, and if we have time, I'll add a bonus section. Uh, understanding cognitive biases, how we can detect these in our browsing data, and what can we do about it? How can we use this information? So let's... Uh, Start with the first section. Let me get my mouse back here. All right. So, uh, hands up if you have a brain. <laughs> Hope, hopefully. Well, you're all biased. All right. I'm biased too. We're all biased. This is something that's natural for humans. As you grow up, from the time you're a child, you learn things about the world about you, and that influences your expectations of the world around you. And that is essentially bias, right? Our expectations uh, bias us towards our, what we expect as responses to certain things, what we expect as uh, someone to respond to the way we act or how we respond to the way somebody else acts. And sometimes our biases or our expectations are challenged and that's what causes us to learn. We learn new things like that, that, right? The first time a child picks up a glass of water and turns it over, they realize that, hey, the water falls down, right? And they got wet. And maybe they liked that or maybe they didn't. But after that, they learn. The second time, they don't necessarily do that uh, wondering what will happen. They know water is going to fall on them, right? That's why we generally put a cup with a lid on it when we give it to children the first time, right? It also helps you to know, like when you're crossing the road, is a car going to hit me or not? Right? Am I going to make it across safely? So. Uh, it stems from our experience, right? We have expectations. Uh, this is, uh, when these expectations are broken, it helps us learn. This is called uh, perceptual or sensory dissonance. Also helps keep us safe. So we have this safety bias, loss aversion, uh, negativity bias. Kind of helps us to stay within a safe zone, not uh, risk too much. We might still take risks, but calculated risks rather than just blind risks. And uh, helps us find our people, right? Um, it's things that we call similarity bias or proximity bias. Uh, we try to avoid uh, risky situations. Uh, bad is generally, feelings of uh, negative feelings, bad feelings are generally stronger than good feelings. And we prefer to hang out with uh, people we like. So a very quick survey here. Um, who prefers PS PSJ versus SRCF, right. SRFC, hmm? PSJ. Are you all from Paris? <laughs> so that's the thing. If you, your local team is not available, maybe you'll support the next local team. And so on. so um, this here is uh, what's called the Cognitive Bias Codex. You can get it on Wikipedia. That's the address down there. Uh, all of these are links to a different type of bias. Uh, there's way more information than I'm going to cover here. You could spend a, a year reading up on all of this. It classifies the uh, biases based on the cognitive load that leads to each one of them. So what do you need to learn or what do you need to accomplish? And that's what uh, results in what you have to get. Uh, there's going to be references at the end of the presentation if you need to go back to any of these. All right. So. If we think specifically in terms of uh, usability, uh, uh, web interfaces, user interfaces, uh, we, we limit it to these ones. Uh, the codex is huge. We want to look at that, that left quadrant, the two left quadrants. What should we remember? That's the one on the top left. And uh, need to act fast. Right? That's the one, I think, on the bottom left. So we have, uh, it's like similarity bias. I feel 
more comfortable with people in situations that I've already seen before or uh, experienced bias. Uh, I feel uh, more uh, comfortable with things which I know I've, uh, I've already done before. Experience bias, where things that uh, happen faster are better than things that happen slower. Oh, did I lose the screen again? Yeah, that's fine. At least I know what to do about that. <laughs> um, right. So uh, I'm going to limit this even further. If I try to do this, it'll take me all day. So if we re restrict it to usability on the web specifically, we come down to these biases. And uh, I'll reduce it even further so I can actually finish in the, the time that I have available. Uh, we'll only talk about these five biases in the stock. Serial position effect, peak end rule, sunk cost, negativity bias, and escalation of commitment. All right, but before we go on to that, um, I need some water, and uh, we're going to have a statistics break. Yeah, I have a bottle. So in, uh, this was uh, research done uh, a few years ago by Tammy Everts. She found that uh, so they did this test where they hooked up people to uh, EM, EMG machines. So they had basically measured their brain waves. And uh, they had them browse a website. And they added an artificial delay to that website. And they just told them, you're testing out this, uh, the usability of this website. Nothing more than that. And half of these users had uh, 500 milliseconds connection speed delay. And the other half just had a regular uh, site. And they found that that delay added up to a 26% increase in peak frustration and an 8% decrease in engagement. So pretty interesting just a way of studying actual users, measuring how they feel by uh, increased latency. All right, so let's move on now. Uh, from some definitions uh, about the data that we're going to be using. The Bounce rate, I'm guessing most people know what bounce rate is. You come to a site, leave after the first page, that's bounce. The percentage of users that bounce after one page is a bounce rate. Retention rate uh, takes that a little further, so bounce rate only applies to the first page of your session. Retention rate applies to every single page of the session. Conversion rate is, does somebody buy something or do an action that you expect them to do? Uh, a goal is the action that they would need to do in order to convert. And finally, something called a frustration index is a way of measuring the frustration looking at all the different events on the page. So not just the whole page load time, but uh, first contentful paint, time to first buy, time to interactive, largest contentful paint, looking at all of those timers and getting a single number out of that. That number is uh, Frustration Index. There's a website called frustrationindex.com that uh, has more details uh, on that. Right. <clears throat> so the, the first bias we were going to look at is the serial position effect. It's the tendency of a person to recall the first and last items in a series best. And so if you're going through multiple pages or you're doing multiple items, you tend to remember the first thing you did and the last thing and you forget everything else in between. Right? This, uh, it was first studied in 1913, right? a long time ago. But there have been several follow-up studies, people verifying if it still applies, also looking at whether it applies to the web. So you'll hear terms like primacy, which generally applies to the first, and recency, which applies to the last. Uh, we find that the recency effect is stronger than the prim primacy effect. So people remember the last thing more likely than the first thing. So our hypothesis with uh, this, kind of, uh, this kind of bias is that the retention rate might be a function of the first, or the performance of the first and latest pages. And the recency effect suggests that the latest page might be more important than the first page, first page of the session. So when looking at the combined effects, we might take the arithmetic mean of the performance of the first and last page, compare that to the mean of the entire session, and see whether there's a noticeable difference or not. Uh, we might also give a higher weight to the last page. The next uh, one is the peak end rule. So in case of serial position, we looked at the first and the last page. In the peak end rule, we still look at the last page, but we, rather than the first page, we look at the most intense page. 
So it could be the page that performed the best or the page that performed the worst across the entire session. And uh, it turns out that the things that are more intense emotionally tend to have a, a more lasting effect. You remember it more. And there have been many studies on this since the 1990s, so more recently. Uh, in 2000, a study specifically looked at web interfaces, and they found that uh, participants interacted with a computer program that had them wait to be served, and at the end of the session, they were asked to rate their experience. So they were basically given a paper form to fill out and say whether they were satisfied or not. And they found that there was a very high correlation with satisfaction if the end of the, the, the entire experience was good, even if they were frustrated throughout the whole thing. Right. So that end part was quite key. And uh, the rest of it, of course, was based on whether there was individual frustrating events or not within, the, within that entire study. <laughs> so in terms of our hypothesis, we'd expect a retention rate to depend on either the best or the worst and the latest experience. And conversion rate, again, to depend on the best or the worst and that of the last page just before the conversion. The, the third bias, the uh, negativity bias, says that uh, even when of equal intensity, negative experiences tend to have a higher weight than positive experiences. So you can, you can think about this uh, if you go on the web or Twitter, search for a certain product, bad performance, right, or it's bad. And you'll find more people talking about how things suck than how things are good. It's just when we are frustrated with something, we need to vent, we need to tell people about it. We'll tell our friends, that this thing was really bad. We'll rarely tell our friends that this thing was good. And that's the effect of negativity, negativity biases. Uh, bad experiences are also perceived to be far more intense than good experiences. So if you have to counter a bad experience, you need to have something that's way more positive than, you can't just counter bad with a lot of neutral. Right? You have to counter bad with really good. So the, the hypothesis that conversion rate should correlate with the ratio or the average of the worst experience to the best experience. And there's something called active listening that can confirm our results. So the, the research around active listening, uh, all right, let me explain what active listening is first. So active listening is essentially, you pay attention to the experience the user is facing and you try and respond to that. So if you see that, uh, you normally expect your page to take, let's say, one and a half second to load. But now you have a, a timer on the page and it's, it's already two and a half seconds, the page is not finished loading. Print a message for the user. Hey, I noticed this page is taking longer than usual to load up. Uh, something going on, please hang with us, right? or bear with us. So just mentioning that I have noticed that your experience sucks is enough for the user to forgive you. Right? You don't actually have to fix it, you just have to tell them, I noticed that you are waiting. And that, that's good enough. So in terms of our data, we don't know if sites have done this or not. So we don't know if uh, there is a confounding factor in our data. We just uh, test based on uh, did they actually respond to negative uh, bias or not. Then uh, escalation of commitment and sunk cost uh, I think the, the simplest way to think about this is uh, gambling, people playing blackjack. In fact, some of these tests were done with people playing back blackjack. It's, uh, if you are facing, uh, as you're losing things, you're trying to try and keep on longer in the hope that you might win and counter your losses. Right? People who are losing at blackjack might just try to play one more hand in the hope of getting that back. Uh, a very good uh, example is the Concorde. So, Anyone here remember the Concorde? The airplane between Paris and New York, right? That, uh, it was way over budget. There were, can you, can you guess how many models uh, projected that it would be profitable? And the answer is zero, right? There were zero uh, assessments and models that showed that this would be profitable. Yet the British government and French government kept on pouring money into it got it completed decades, uh, I don't think it was decades late, but it was late, and they kept running it for decades at a loss until they finally gave up, right? So that is all in the hope that 
we've already paid so much money, let's try some more. Right? Uh, um, this is a very real uh, bias that affects people a lot. Your site can definitely be as fast as a Concorde, but probably should not be as expensive. <laughs> Our uh, expectation here is that a high session length, the longer people stay on your site, the more likely they are to convert, even if the performance is bad. And uh, the retention or conversion rate increases as session length increases. So just uh, summarizing our hypothesis here. We expect that the latest, uh, most recent experience is very impactful. The best and or the worst experiences are somewhat impactful. The first experience may be impactful. And the amount of time someone stays on the site is impactful. So uh, we'll get to the data. I wanted to get a, another stats break in here. How are we doing on time? I know we started a little late. So, uh, anyone here from Wikipedia? And th this study was published uh, around the time I last spoke at uh, We Love Speed. So, it's, it's been a while, but they, they found that a 4% temporary improvement in page performance uh, resulted in an equally temporary 1% increase in perceived satisfaction. So what they did was essentially put a little pop-up on the page saying, were you satisfied with this, the performance of this page? Yes, no, or no comment. Right? Those are three options. They randomized the options, randomized which users got the, the pop-up and not. And they found that uh, in a temporary improvement to page performance also improves page satisfaction. So they accounted for selection bias. Um, and also uh, basically by swapping the, the order of things. Um, they didn't account for the Hawthorne effect. So the Hawthorne effect is another bias that says, if you tell somebody that they're being measured, they will change the way they respond. Right? So everyone who opted into this basically now knew that their response is being recorded and they may have said yes, no, or no, based simply on the fact that they were asked about it. All right, so how do we detect this bias in our data? <clears throat> so some short notes about the data. We collect data using a tool called Boomerang. It's a JavaScript library to collect web performance from users as they browse the site. Uh, we define a session as, uh, an, it's based on an anonymous session ID. It lasts for 30 minutes of inactivity and it's limited to sessions of 30 pages or fewer. Right? Uh, although the session length analysis actually looks at longer sessions, but uh, for everything else we look at 30 or more or fewer. Uh, samples analysis was done across multiple websites, each of which uh, we looked at several weeks of data, uh, millions of data points each. And we looked at the page load time, time to interactive, largest contentful paint, and the frustration index across all of these. So our first one, the serial position effect. So what we expect is that uh, there was a strong negative correlation between the performance of the first page and, uh, and conversion rate. That's kind of expected, actually. If you think about it, uh, if your first page is slow, people will likely bounce. And we actually see that if we translate that to look at bounce rate instead of uh, conversion rate, we see that it, as the performance of the first page gets worse, the bounce rate essentially goes up. Uh, it's starting at 40%, so it's already high bounce rate, but it ends up at 60% at 80, uh, 18 seconds or 50% in nine seconds, so it's, it's increasing pretty steadily. And there is a double peak here. Um, I'm not going to go into details about that uh, for this slide. I will talk about the double peak here. So the second one we looked at was the, the last page. Uh, this is, like I said, the last page before conversion. So um, let's define that very specifically. If you are on a shopping website and you click check out now, you then get to another page where you enter credit card details or payment information, and then you click a submit, and then it gets to another page, and that says uh, it's basically your confirmation page. So when the user gets to a confirmation page, that is the only time that your analytics tool collects the information that the user has converted, right? But the user in their mind 
has thought about converting two pages before that, when they click checkout now. So there's a difference in when the user thinks they have converted and your analytics knows that they have converted. So what we are doing is trying to collect information about when the user thinks they've collect, converted, because that is what's affected by the bias, not when your analytics thinks they've converted. Right? So this was not the page where the conversion happened, not the page where they enter the details, but the page where they say, I am now ready to buy. Right? And we look at that, we find that uh, there is this very narrow peak. Right? It, it shoots all the way up and then it drops. It's at 300 milliseconds, the conversion rate was 13.5%, and it drops to 1% at five seconds. And that's a very small gap. It drops to almost zero when we're getting past uh, 18. In fact, I think at around 10, it dropped to uh, this 0.4 value. Now we see that the two peaks there, it turns out that this for, for this particular site, they had two ways of the user saying check out now. Uh, they could click check out now and it would refresh the entire page and give them a full uh, thing to enter their credit card details, or it would pop up a little thing that was submitted via XHR. So that first peak is the XHR one, and the second peak is the full page load. Mm, turns out that uh, there's way, you know, the user is way more likely to convert for that first one. The dip in the middle is just because that's how the populations were divided. So if you look at the two population charts separately, they actually uh, overlap at that point. Right. So the next thing we look at is, uh, this is for the, the first two were for the serial position effect. The second and third are for the peak end rule. So we looked at the end, looking at the fastest page. This has a really uh, big effect. So again, we see a spike over here, it's 10.5%. With some of the sites I looked at, it can go up to 26% conversion rate at that 500 milliseconds range, right? So we're looking at the fastest page has to be really fast, right? To counter any negativity bias across the, the site, you have to have a really fast page. But if you think about it a different way, if your fastest page is really slow, what are the rest of the pages? Right? So your fastest page has to be really fast. Now there's a practical lower limit on that. Uh, it takes time to serve pages, right? You don't expect zero milliseconds, right? There's the speed of light, there's the speed of uh, generating the page and all of that, so about 200 milliseconds or so is kind of a, uh, just a practical lower limit on that. Now, correlation with the slowest page is a little weird, right? So I'm actually gonna spend a little more time on the, the slowest page, so. The first thing I looked at was, what is the correlation of conversion rate with the slowest page? And it turned out it was, the slower your site, the better your conversions. You just have to make a slow site and you'll get more users. But it turns out that when you actually click that buy now and uh, enter your credit card details, that's a slow process because it has to go to the credit card processor, verify your credit card details and all of that. And that is the slowest page. So the user's already committed to converting at that point. So instead of looking at that, we decided to look at the second slowest page. Uh, there's also, an, uh, we would have expected really fast pages to convert better, but what it turns out that very fast pages um, might actually be uh, with JavaScript errors, they're blank pages. So it turns out that's a single page session. The fastest page and the slowest page is actually the same page. That's why you have a low conversion rate on, very, on the very fast side. So looking at the second slowest page, we get a more uh, expected chart. And again, we verify the data. This was the point where, um, well, some point between the user starting the session and deciding to convert. Uh, we find that uh, about 4.8% at two seconds. So remember, slowest page, it's not gonna be really fast like the 500 milliseconds, but it is uh, going to be a reasonably uh, performing page and all down to 1% at 19 seconds. So for everything except the first page, we considered the, the, the pages prior to converted. Right? For the first page, of course, that doesn't matter because we're only looking at the first page. And uh, everything else is also non-bound sessions. So how does uh, this affect retention rate? So far we've been talking about conversion rate. 
Uh, the dependence for retention rate is a combination of the fastest and the latest pages. So uh, the peak end rule affects it, but it's the, the fast peak and not the slow peak that matters. Um, but if it depends on the, on the first page, then that is basically the, the biggest uh, factor. And that, again, feeds into the fact that the first page affects bounce rate more than anything else, because <laughs> there is no other page. <laughs> um, la the type of landing page affects retention rate the most. So for home pages and other landing pages, the first page uh, is the most important. If a user enters your page, your site directly, and it doesn't perform, they leave. But if they come in from a search engine, they might end up on a product detail or a category page they might tolerate a slower page. And that's kind of the, the usual user showing intent to find something specific versus you intent to uh, look at your site. And there's a different intent, and their biases are different based on what their intent was at that point of time. So negativity bias. This uh, was a little more complicated to study. Uh, what we needed to do was look at a combination of the best performing page and the second worst performing page. So we looked at the ratio, that's the worst performing page divided by the best performing page, the, the performance of the two. And we looked at the geometric mean. So geometric mean is essentially you take the product of the two values and take the square root of that. So what we find is that there's this negative correlation for the arithmetic mean, uh, sorry, for the ratio, and a strong peak for the, for the geometric mean. So that's kind of confusing. It was confusing for me when doing the research, it was confusing for me when writing the slides. So uh, try and look at it a little uh, simpler, one step at a time. So like I said earlier, we have, where's my slide? <coughs> we have a practical lower bound on what the fastest, site, uh, fastest page can be, right? Uh, typically around 200 milliseconds, so that's what we're seeing around here at around, uh, this is where we have this little thick band here. So that's, that's generally, you, you're un, ex, unlikely to have a site overall that's faster than that. And we have a tolerable upper bound on that. Again, we've seen that from the fastest page performance. So somewhere around here is where your tolerable upper bound is. And so what we see then is that slow pages are tolerated only when they're paired with a fast page that's 15 times faster than that slow page. So your, your slowest page in this entire session cannot be slower than 15 times your fastest page. And if your fast page is already slow, like around one second, then you're, um, you're really uh, going way beyond where you can, you can support a slow user. But if you have a fast page that's uh, in this range, sub uh, 500 milliseconds, sub uh, half a second, you can get to a little more of a, a slow page. So that's essentially, you have to have a really intense, like a 15x multiplier of positive to negative to balance the negativity bias. The, the last one we looked at was uh, escalation of commitment, right? What we expect, again, repeating the hypothesis, a greater tendency to continue and endeavor once an investment in a money effort or time has been made. So, this is what we see. Essentially, the, this is the x-axis is the number of pages a user has viewed before converting, and the y-axis is the conversion rate, and it goes for 0.6% after viewing five pages to about 30% after viewing 30 pages on the site. And it just keeps going on. So even looking at it across load times, so looking at it across performance, it really does not matter. If the user has viewed a lot of pages, even for slow sites, so we're looking at about 15 seconds average uh, performance across the session, and there's still pretty high conversion rate. That's around 50% uh, around here. Right. Whereas if they, had, uh, if they had fast sites, they were likely to convert no matter what. But if they had slow sites, they were likely to convert only if the user spent more time on the site. So that kind of... Uh, <laughs> It says that if your site is slow, do whatever you can to keep the user hooked. <laughs> Last stats break, I think. So um, this was a study done by Ericsson. 
they uh, had users, uh, again, they hooked them up to an uh, ECG and uh, EMG machine, and uh, ECG machine, they measured their heart rates uh, while they viewed the uh, slow site. And it was equivalent, so 38% was the rise in their heart rate uh, for slow sites. It was like watching a horror movie alone. All right, so accounting for bias, what can we do to account for all these biases? Well, how can we use that information to make our sites faster? Well, the first thing to know is you don't have to make every single page on your site faster. You have to you focus your performance improvements on certain key pages. Right? If you know how your user is going through the site, then you can identify their, the, the last page that they're likely to be on, the first page they're likely to be on, and in between, you can, you can adapt to what the performance is. So performance of the first page affects bounces. Definitely, you want your landing pages to be fast. We've seen that if they come into category pages, then that you can account for a little more slowness there. Uh, the fastest page and the last page affects retention. So have at least one really fast page in the user's flow. The slowest page in the session should not be no more than 15 times. Uh, the latency of the fastest page. If you start detecting it's getting slow, then practice active listening, display a pop-up to the user saying, I think we're being a little slow, hang in with us, uh, we'll get faster, <laughs> don't worry about it. A fast page increases the number of pages per session. So every single, every time a user is on a fast page, they're likely to stay for another page. And the more pages they stay on, the more likely they are to convert. So. Obviously, having fast pages, uh, especially your product listing pages, category pages, where a user spends a lot of time on those kinds of pages, that's likely to increase your likelihood of conversion. And their most patient, actually, this is another uh, statistics break, something we found that users are more patient when using the web from the office, least patient when using it on their phones. So try and sell to people when they're in the office. I'm, this was my bonus section, which I am actually not going to go into. So if you have questions, uh, we can, I can take them now. Merci, Philippe. Any question? Hey, Philippe, thank you for this. Um, you've been in the field for a while, and now that you're doing all that research, what's the more surprising to you? What, what were the results that you've showed today that you were not expecting to discover? Um, well, I, I'd say I wasn't expecting any of these. I, the, like I said, some of the research was done in 1913, right? We were using like the telegraph and Morse code back then. So latency was a different ball game. But, uh, it turns out that uh, research done in other fields is very applicable to web performance. So some of this research was done in uh, health sciences. Some of it was done in gastronomy. Some of it was done in business, but they all are applicable to the web because the web is a medium for running these kinds of businesses, right? You could be, well, we have shopping websites, we have health websites, we have uh, food blogs and all kinds of things. So I think there, it's, uh, it's very interesting, the, the kind of cross-functional uh, research that is applicable. Yeah, it, it, yeah it's, it's not uh, the same. There is some differences uh, across countries. So specifically, let's say we, we looked at frustration index for people from different parts of the world, right? Um, I'll just take the US and Canada has very similar infrastructure, very similar performing websites, but 
patience or the frustration, tolerable frustration values for people from Canada is five times higher than that for people from America. Right? Uh, Germans tend to be the least patient in the whole world. <laughs> Australians tend to be the most patient in the whole world. Um, I, it may or may not have to do with the people, may have more to do with the infrastructure. So in Australia, for example, they're used to slow internet because the, the gateway getting out of Australia is really slow. So that's why they are just more patient with using the web. Um, maybe in Germany, the, they're used to faster sites, so that's why. Uh, you know, I, I don't know why this is the case. This is just what I've seen. And again, using from the office, uh, people are more patient than on their phones, probably because they have to pay versus get it for free. <laughs> D'autres questions? Si vous vous sentez pas en anglais, on peut vous aider à traduire. Et, et Philippe comprend le français. Uh, it is said that 78% of the statistics are wrong. What do you think? No, it's just a joke. joke. Well, yeah, that, that's uh, actually my, <laughs> my bonus section, but uh, I have slides for that. <laughs> Good. So, no. <laughs> can, can you elaborate, sir? Can you elaborate a bit more on the uh, frustration index and how it is used, or how people in the room can use this? Uh, some some very practical use cases you've, you've seen. Yeah, I'd I'd say uh, well, well, this is one of them. For example, it's like don't. Uh, don't just rely on anybody else's results. Uh, there are studies that say a lot of things, including all the studies I've done and presented here. So you need to go and test for your own data. Uh, like I've shown in most of my charts, it's not, the curves are not straight lines. They're basically, they're different kinds of distributions, gamma distributions, log normal distributions, and so on. So you cannot say anything like, uh, you know, I increased my performance by 10% and I got uh, so much improvement in conversion. Like which 10%, right? If you went from 10 seconds to 9 seconds, that's way different than going from and 4 seconds to 3 seconds. Like the user notices the things differently. <laughs> so uh, those are things to keep in mind. But in terms of frustration index, I'd say we, it's still a developing uh, concept. So there are, there it's, it's based on thresholds. We have to determine whether the thresholds are right or not. Uh, the website in, in uh, explains it a little more. It's uh, developed by Tim Variki, who's going to be speaking later today. So you can attend his talk and ask him more questions about it. That, um, but yeah, that, those are the things. Uh, yeah, definitely always double check your results. Uh, another thing I wanted to show is uh, this is, these are four different distributions that have exactly the same uh, values for uh, median, uh, for mean standard deviation, uh, row linear regression and r squared values. So you have to understand your data distribution and not just uh, what your one number is. I mean, a lot of tools will give you one number and say this is what your performance is. And that's not always uh, enough information. Yeah, there's a question. Is that the last question? We've got time. Uh, thank you, Philip. Uh, unless I missed it, I don't think you've told us about the 50% bump at nine seconds or something like that. Which which one was that? There was oh, the the bounce rate. You're talking. I, about? I think you've promised us. Like I'm going to mention it later, and I I think I'm. Just tell me when I hit that slide. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This one. This one. Yeah, just after the oh, nine the second. One? No, I, sorry. I, yeah, I, I did not. I have not done the, so I don't have oh, the information okay, about that. Yeah. Uh, I did do the analysis for this. Why we have a double bump there? This one it was weird. Actually, this this bump here. There's it showed up in a lot of the charts for this customer. And my guess is that there's some synthetic bot that's running a lot. So there's also a spike in the number of sessions just in that. Period. And it's very unlikely for like a large number of humans to come in and get exactly the same performance. So it's probably something synthetic happening there. On a encore du temps pour une question. All right. 
Eh bien, merci Philippe. Merci beaucoup pour cette présentation.